Hey, Dave Kittle here on the Dave Kittle Show. I'm the owner of Concierge Pain Relief Home Physical Therapy in New York City and the CEO of the Fieldmaker Group. We're currently speaking with practice owners of partnering or acquiring some or all of their practice. And we have physical therapist and practice owner Tony Maritato back on the show. He is based in Ohio. He is a physical therapist, a practice owner, a multi-site practice owner. I would say a whole bunch of other things. I don't want him to you know, blush and get all uh, get all nervous, which which he doesn't. But online entrepreneur, he's built websites, choose PT first. Is it choose PT first.com? Yep. Choose PT first.com. You got it. Learn Medicare billing.com. I-, I love to promote and I don't get anything from it. I love to promote everything Tony does. Tony, welcome back on the show. Dave, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited about today's topic because I think a lot of clinicians who have been following you and I see your audience growing. What we're going to talk about today is kind of a continuity of what they need to know about, which is what do you do after an exit? What do you do with the money that you get this lump sum that you didn't have on Sunday, but now you have on Tuesday? Exactly. So provisional title, we're going with the truth about being a millionaire physical therapy practice owner. So just when you hear that, like what's your initial takeaways or what's your initial thoughts around that? It's interesting. I mean, growing up, uh, I'm 47. I'm not sure you're like 28. Uh, it's one of those things where... 30, oh, kid, hold on, 36. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as a kid, when I grew up as a kid, I would hear millionaire and I would think like, wow, that's incredible. Now, with everything inflation and you you hear these companies that are in the billions, like million doesn't seem like that much anymore. You know, and and I swear a lot of it depends on who you surround yourself with. Now, I don't have a big community around me. I'm a homebody. I stay with my family. But through social media, through YouTube, I do have voices in my head that I listen to on a daily basis that are talking in billions rather than millions. So for me, you know, a million dollars was like way beyond anything I could imagine when I was in my 20s. Now in my late 40s, going into 50s, I would like to see more tens of millions rather than a million. But what about you? Like, what does a million dollars mean to you? Even the term a millionaire? Well, I mean, more recently, I was mentioning uh, in the pre-interview, like the accredited investor definition, which is like, let me pull it up. So it's the SEC created this definition around accredited investors. So this would be like an individual, let's just say before this was a definition, an individual who had some excess funds and they would do things like either invest in stocks and bonds, maybe they invest in like real estate, they invest in these self-storage things. Self-storage is like the biggest thing now someone who has discretionary income they could be you know physicians or dentists or they could you know be lawyers or you know it could be anyone it could be someone who's got one or more multiple businesses like you right so someone who has like discretionary income and they have to put it somewhere and they maybe invest in some of these these assets that we're talking about so the sec defines an accredited investor as either an individual with gross income exceeding two hundred thousand dollars in each of the last two most recent years or joint income with a spouse or partner exceeding $300,000 for those last two years and a reasonable expectation of the same income level in the current year. So if you're making that amount of money and you're able to have that excess money after you know your cost of living and, and all that, you probably have a net worth of a million dollars. And if you, I don't know, if we're just thinking of like one of us or someone listening to the show, like if they have a business that's making a million dollars a year in revenue and maybe after owner perks and salary and owner draw and all these other, you know, write-offs and and things like that and deductions, if they're taking home $200,000, I don't know, are they a millionaire? I mean, I, they, they're, they have something that is valued now three or four times that take home dollar amount. So let's just say three or four times that 250 grand on an annual basis is approximately a million dollars. Now they don't have it liquid in their bank account or they may not, but they have this business and it could be 80 or 90% of their net worth. But I would call that individual and it could be you know someone who owns a bagel shop near you or it could be the physical therapist near you. But if those types of numbers at the, at the minimum, I think that person is a millionaire now. What do you think? I think there's a lot more millionaires than we even imagine. I know I don't feel like a millionaire by any means. 
but you probably have to do the same thing that I do. You have to put together a personal financial statement every year and you have to send it off to the powers that be. And when I look at those numbers, I just, I can't even imagine those numbers, you know, like I have that in my possession. And like you said, it's not liquid. It's not like Scrooge McDuck and I'm swimming through a vault of money. But at the same time, when you really look at the paper value that we have behind us, yeah, your practice, your automotive, you know, your vehicles, your house, your other real estate, all of that, it, it adds up pretty quick. And so I think one, as practice owners, we get so hung up in the day to day, we should take a step back. And we should appreciate what we've accumulated. We should appreciate and acknowledge kind of what we've built and allow ourselves to feel good about that before we put our nose to the grindstone again and start working, you know, the next day. For sure. So you were mentioning like, all right, so a practice owner listening, if they were to exit, they partner with a, a, another buyer or and maybe they sell 70 or 80% of their practice, or maybe they sell outright, they, they sell 100% of their practice. So now all of a sudden, maybe they have $1 million, $2 million, $3 million in their bank account. And I mean, then the next step, the next conversation would be like, we can get to about like, then you got to think about like where to put it and what to do with it. But like, initially it's like, you get this liquid money in your bank account, but now you don't have that cash flow, that business anymore. You don't have like the, the, the same monthly income other than like maybe the interest of that chunk of money, right? So are there any considerations there for practice owners to just think about before we get into like then what to do with it? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I seem to, and I, it's by no means planned in any way. Um, over the last five or six years, it seems like once a year, we, ha we, my family and I have a major financial transaction, whether I'm selling a piece of real estate, selling a business, selling something. And we get this huge lump sum deposit and if you've watched any, when I say you, I'm talking to the audience watching this. If you've watched any of the business shows, you know, you hear the same thing. Like when a founder has an exit, and they get this big transfer of money, wealth into their bank account. It's just this weird, almost surreal. You see all these zeros behind the number and you can't even believe it. But then an hour or two later, kind of the euphoria wears off and you're back to living your normal life. And so it's the same with us. I don't know that too many people would experience a, a sale in the seven figures and not have something already set up, not have, the, not have that next project ready to go. It's just like, I would never sell my residence without having another house that I'm already moved into or living in. So you have more experience than me dealing with buyers and sellers. I just know that anytime I've ever sold anything, I've already been on to the next project and, you know, that money goes into the bank, it goes into the investments and I don't even really, it doesn't change anything in the way I, I operate day to day. Yeah, makes sense. So when you in the past have sold some real estate, like, do you mind discussing like yeah. either what you actually done with it or like, do you put it in other real estate? Do you put it in like, what do you put in stocks and bonds, some type of Vanguard that like, diversified portfolio? Do you, you know, do some, uh, like some life insurance policies? Like, what are some things that you're comfortable chatting about? Like, where does that money go? Yeah. So again, like most of the audience probably watching this, listening to the podcast, watching the YouTube, you know, while I might be more on the risk on side, my wife is more the traditional physical therapist. She was a physical therapist long before me. She comes from a very stable family. Her dad worked in the steel mill his whole life. Her mom was a stay-at-home mom, just a, a wonderful like Irish Catholic upbringing. And so anytime money comes into our family, it goes into the absolute most secure, like no chance we're going to lose anything other than lose to inflation uh, investment. So it's a combination of insurance policies, if we need access to capital, we'll put it into a money market that we have. Probably the bulk of our income goes into some version of an insurance policy, whether it's a whole life policy or something along those lines that we can contribute at an accelerated rate and with the intention that we can either borrow against that if we need it in the future at a 1% interest or whatever it is that gets paid back to us. 
And then once we pass a certain age, we would then start to pull distributions from that policy. So that's really the main thing. And then like right now we have plans to sell a piece of real estate, commercial real estate down in Florida. So the, these real estate transactions should close within the next three to five months. If I was uh, doing what I should do, I would do a 1031 exchange, put that money into the next piece of property, grow the real estate portfolio. But that would put a little more risk on us than I think we're comfortable with right now. We have four boys. The boys are getting ready to move into high school and then eventually college. So we're not going to do that. We're going to use that money to pay down some debt, some debt on existing real estate that's a little bit higher of an interest rate and a floating interest rate that I have no idea where it's going to go, but I don't expect interest rates to go down. Floating interest rate meaning variable? Yeah, it's a variable rate. So it adjusts annually. It was part, we, we did a purchase where we, the medical building we're in right now, 50% of it, don't quote me on that, 50 or 40% was financed through SBA. The other half was financed through the bank. I think we put 10% down initially. And so the bank portion right now is adjusted annually to market rate. And so I, I just, I imagine those rates are going to continue to go up. I'm not going to put that money. The real estate that we're selling, it's free and clear. I have no debt on the real estate. So we're getting this large lump sum, but I'm like, well, I'm not going to put it in the market. I'm not going to put it into crypto. I'm not going to put it into anything reasonably speculative. And even within my own existing businesses right now, like I make a fair income from online resources. I don't take payment from a lot of the online resources that that is earning me income because I have nothing to do with it. Like if I accept that payment, I'm just gonna pay taxes on it. So I let the companies that owe me money hang on to the cash because I don't need it right now until I have a purpose, until I have something to have invested in. And so, you know, it's one of those things where I think, the person who is looking at their exit, they're looking at selling, they're looking looking at moving on. You know, obviously you have to talk to a financial planner, you have to talk to a professional. I am not one, but for me and my family, I'm always balancing potential growth, potential loss, and just how well we sleep at night. You know, and and despite knowing that I lose money from to inflation and I lose opportunity, I sleep really well at night. Like I have zero worries about what's going to happen to my portfolio on my money tomorrow morning. I can make more money just as quickly or more quickly actively than I'm worried about making money in an investment. So I just keep my extra capital locked up tight. You can't put a price on the sleeping well at night, right? You can't. You can't, especially when you you have people in the family that you care about and you love that aren't comfortable with you, you know, putting anything at risk. So I, I always say, like, like most buying decisions, we buy based on emotion. I want to buy a car. It's because I love that car. It makes me feel good. If I'm going to do something with extra money, I'm going to do something that makes me feel good, and that is keeping it safe because I'm not going to spend it. I don't have anything to do with it. It doesn't matter to me. So I want the people around me to feel safe and know that it's there no matter what. Makes a lot of sense. If for some reason, if anyone on the the show, the podcast, you know, YouTube right now, if you don't know Tony Martado, I didn't mention in the beginning, but so he owns two locations. Is it two locations? Total Therapy Solutions? Yeah, we, we have two locations in Ohio. We were as big as five locations, three in Florida, two in Ohio. The general practice, for those of you who maybe don't know me, it's primarily outpatient orthopedics. So when I started the practice, I was not a physical therapist. My wife, who wasn't my wife at the time, she was my business partner. She was the physical therapist. And then as we grew, I became a physical therapist because I just love the profession. I love treating patients. But our top priority was always just kind of growing the business, financial security for ourselves, for our team, the people that worked with us. And we grew from, you know, an 800 square foot little single personal training studio into five physical therapy clinics across two states. We employed 
PTs, OTs, and then all of our admin staff. We brought billing in-house. We really were obsessed with operations. We love operations. I love the creative aspect of operations. And then probably around 2010, 11, we started to consolidate. We sold one clinic. We closed the other two. The therapists that used to work for us now either work for themselves or own the clinics. And uh, we still keep a hand in two clinics here in Ohio with a very small team. Because again, physical therapy is my passion. I enjoy it. I enjoy being in the clinic. I was in the clinic this morning. But I, I don't ever want to depend on patient care for my livelihood. I don't ever want to make those decisions where am I going to treat a patient for eight more minutes or am I going to pay the mortgage? Those are not decisions that I ever want to make. Mm, makes a lot of sense. Uh, you do all this stuff online and videos. And it's like if you're not connected with Tony Maritato or Anthony Maritato on Facebook, you sh you should absolutely or, and especially YouTube subscribe to the, the YouTube channel. Um, you should connect with him on Facebook because of the really interesting posts. With the amount of money that you have, you I think you have enough discretionary money where how come you haven't built like a mini Mr. Beast YouTube studio yet? Like it do you, are you is that on the horizon? Is there gonna be some uh Ohio based the way uh, Mr. Beast has got some big uh I think like not air not air like an old airport or some uh airport yeah, yeah. hangar or something like that? Are you are you considering some YouTube studio. Is that on the horizon? It was a consideration. So Mr. Beast has this like compound with studios and all this stuff. The building that I bought, the building that I occupy right now, it's a 10,500 square foot building in Ohio, right off of I-75. And it's one of those places where I originally, it's kind of an interesting story for anybody who's interested. So I originally came in as a 20% part, part owner. I thought I was buying into a condominium. This is how poorly... I look at contracts sometimes. So the intent was <laughs> I'm buying my condo, which is 20% of this building. The building was designed as a spine center. It included orthopedic surgeons, spine uh, pain care, psychology, chiropractic, massage, and physical therapy. So the orthopedic surgeon who put it all together invited me to come on board. I said, that's awesome, but I'm never going to work for somebody. I will do this as long as I can own my portion of the building and as long as I maintain my independence as a business owner. So that's what we did. Long story short, the Spine Center fell apart. Who would imagine the Spine Center could fall apart, but they didn't have the business operations in place they needed to go from a single provider to like six providers. So everything collapsed. We came in and bought the rest of the building. So now we're 100% owner of the building. And my goal was to take some of that building and turn it into a YouTube studio. Like there is such a massive need for healthcare related topics, YouTube channels. I still think like I have no doubt if any clinician out there, PTOTSOP, was to take the patient care experience and mix a little bit of like reality TV into what they do on a daily basis they would be making mid six figures, 500,000 a year, just taking normal cases, normal patients, getting consent, even paying that patient a portion of the revenue and just sharing that information online. The saying is build it once, sell it twice. Like once I treat the first patient who's had a total knee replacement, why in the world would I not capture that experience and get it out to the rest of the world and allow advertisers to pay me a rate of 12 to $15 per thousand views to help people who will never have access to me as a therapist or even potentially therapy in general, people that are in other countries, people that just don't have the financial means. You know, you're helping the world you're earning more money than you ever would with third-party reimbursement. You're giving the best patient care experience to the individual in front of you because I guarantee you're gonna be the best therapist you can be if you know millions of people are watching. Like, it's just a no-brainer. So that that was a consideration with the building we had. Now the building is full with other healthcare providers, so I'll have to find a new place to build my YouTube empire. <laughs> now, would, would this be specifically for your stuff and your channels? Or, or were you also thinking of like renting it out to other people? I would rent it out. I would I would tell people, come on in. I've got patients. I've got facility. Like, 
there are so many amazing clinicians out there that from what I've heard now, I don't, I don't know this, but I've been told MedBridge, which I love MedBridge, they will fly the clinician out to record in their studios. It would basically be something like that. You know, you would fly the clinician out, you would do the recording, you'd get maybe 12 treatments in in a two week period, it'd be a short, highly intense, um, but just to capture all of that. Like I am not a good enough clinician to want to record that I'll, I'll record the stuff that I can record but I think we have so many amazing resources out there in the community within the profession that that would be amazing whether I did it or anyone did it I I think you're you're always so I think you're too nice about that because you I've seen so many of your YouTube or even before you were doing YouTube your Facebook videos yeah. <laughs> and like all these little creative like manual therapy or creative like therapeutic exercise adjustments or like regressions or progressions with patients using like monster bands and like all sure. this like nuanced equipment and even back when i was doing the other podcast with, with rob vining shout out rob vining and and i'd be like he would say something or i would see it and i'd be like did you see the thing that tony did to like loosen up someone's total knee replacement or like the the thing is like so it's so obscure but it, it like you try it and it's like oh my god this works it's unbelievable and it's it's not in any continuing education course but it's like something that just works those types of things you were doing even before YouTube. I wanted to get back to, so I had a I had an idea or or something around that where using because in in Brooklyn, I'm in I'm in New York City, and there's so many of my friends and and guys I play baseball with that are in like movie and like arts and film and stuff. And have you noticed like the show, not the a YouTube show with uh, Dave Portnoy from Barstool where the one bite yeah. and he'll, he goes to a pizza place and he he eats a slice. Yep. And then what happens after that? Because he's so popular, he's got a big following. What happens at that place afterwards? It blows up, yeah. It blows up. Now, he doesn't charge anything. Right. But but I was I was thinking, like, how come physical therapists don't do something like that to kind of have some something happen at their office? And it's like, it's like indirect marketing or it's a way, because you were just saying like that other example. So a way to have like, maybe it's a documentary, maybe, you know, a documentary on Brooklyn or a documentary on, you know, the streets of Brooklyn or whatever. But like in the backdrop, then there's like these houses or these places that like people are like, oh, that that house or that building or that business or whatever was in that show, that Netflix show or that documentary, or it was on Dave Portnoy's uh, 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 One Bite or whatever, whatever he calls it. So those are the types of things that physical therapists could do. To, to improve yeah. their their awareness, their marketing, and and do it in a way where if they didn't let's, they didn't take someone's insurance contract or it was you know uh, and, and they had no insurance or something they could film that experience of that that client that patient and put it up on YouTube and then you get income you get income or, or revenue from a different source for that as opposed to from that individual person that patient. I mean, we're, we're talking about millionaire therapists, millionaire practices, like how do we scale to a million? I don't know if you remember a while back, I had shared a picture of a book. I don't remember the exact title of the book, but it was like one person millionaire businesses or something like that. And, and we really do live in a time where a single individual with no employees could scale a business to a million dollars a year. Now, of course, everybody comes at me with, well, is that revenue or profit? Who cares? It's a million dollars. Like, right, you're, right. it's enough for one person to live comfortably. But the point in that is when we're looking at leveraging the assets we have within the profession, within our knowledge base, you know, our experiences, you can just, I think it's overwhelming, truthfully. And I think that's why we don't see it happen enough is because we're like, well, we could do this and we could do that. And I could do, you know. But I would say at the very minimum, I had shared some YouTube videos a couple of years ago, especially during the pandemic, where I was like, think of it like this. I meet a new patient. Now, because my niche is total knee replacement, I get a new patient, you know, multiple new patients a week for total knee replacement recovery. I, I record the initial evaluation for that. Now, I'm going to bill insurance because that's a billable event and I'm going to make 120 bucks. Okay. But if I record content or clips or any piece of that, and I share it on YouTube. YouTube is going to pay me not just today, not just this year, but for a decade because knee replacements are going to be happening for the foreseeable future. And I've got videos on YouTube 
that have generated several hundreds of dollars, some in the thousands. And so when you look at that one hour of my life, my patient's life that I would have exchanged for 120 bucks and I never would have monetized that in any way. I record any kind of content from that. I make it available on a public forum, obviously with patient consent and respecting HIPAA and privacy. But the idea is that now that one session could generate a thousand dollars of revenue. And if I'm doing 20 of those sessions a week, even though 80% of them are just going to go into the ether and nobody's ever going to want to see them and they're going to be crummy. Even if 5% generate $1,000 over the lifetime of that video, that is a digital asset that continues to pay you. And then you monetize it to the consumer. You monetize it to the public through YouTube. You monetize the same exact patient care experience with other clinicians. You know, Dave, you and I have talked about this. Like I had hired Rob Vining to do a cervical evaluation for one of my patients who was in the clinic with me. And so I paid him a contract rate. We recorded the experience. He was coming to me through telehealth. But the idea is as a student, I could see what he could do as a McKenzie therapist. And then an hour later, I could grab a pelvic floor therapist in New York to come into my clinic and do the same thing. And so Every therapist has value. Every therapist has something special, whether it's the way you talk to a patient. You know, therapists freak out. And I've been recording these videos and and they still freak out. I haven't taken a patient into a patient, like into an exam room for like three years, five years, something like that. Literally every one of my patients, I do, I do probably 10, 15 evals a week. They come in, they walk into my front clinic, they walk into my door. We sit at the front counter. We talk a little bit. First thing we do, the first seat they take is on an exercise bike or UBE, or we go straight to the art trainer. I show them where they can hang their coat and we get on a machine and we start working out. Like we go straight into the workout. I've never seen this person before in my life, but the three to five minutes that I spent during the patient admission at the front desk was enough for me with the evidence that, hey, you drove here. You dressed yourself before you arrived, and you fed yourself, you bathed yourself, you're handling your finances, you paid your copay. You can probably sit on a recumbent bike and pedal while we do the rest of this evaluation, right? And so when you think of that, there are therapists that hate that, and I respect that. And, and 10 years ago, I would have gone in the room, we would have spent 30 minutes, and we would have gotten to know each other, and I would have built trust, and I would have done all of that stuff. But for a student to be able to see whether they choose to do it the way I do it or hate the way I do it, doesn't matter. Like, oh, that's an, op- value. That, that's an option. Or it's something that I'm never going to do. Like you could decide that too. But to allow a student to see me do what I do, do the way I do it in real life, and then to see you and then to see somebody else and then to see 20 other people for 10 bucks, right? And so if, if 10 students pay 10 bucks to watch me do a real life evaluation, that's 100 bucks. My 120 just turned into 220 and that's recorded. So that's got lifetime value. So even if that continued to sell 10 a month, I'm at $1,200 a month, you know, or a year for that one experience that we capture. We are building value and burning it every single time we see a patient and we don't capture that value in any other way. And it just, that's why we can't scale to a million as a single individual, because I promise Everyone watching this, you have a million dollar business in your possession. You're just not monetizing it in a way to get Mm. to a million with no team. Mm. Yeah, that was an incredible insight. I think everyone should just rewind 10 or 20 (laughs) seconds back and listen to that again. I would say how many private practice owners in PTOT SLP with, you know, let's just say outpatient rehab. What percentage of them do you think are millionaires? Do you think I would say at least 50 percent? What do you think? If you had to guess, Ooh, I don't. I don't think it's that yeah. high. I think the debt, think debt to income. I think the debt is just crazy when you look at how much you owe on the house, how much you owe from your education. If you guys haven't done a personal financial statement, do a personal financial statement. You can go to Google. You can download it. You can plug in the numbers. You plug in how much you owe. You plug in how much you you have. Put those numbers together. I would truthfully, and it's a total guess, 20%. Mm-hmm. I would say 20%. But of course, you're talking 
are we talking, you know, 30 year olds or are we talking 50 year olds? Like, hopefully, if we're talking 50, 60 year olds, they better be, yeah. Talking more, higher percentage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. The idea that you just were talking about, about filming the patient experience, we just get a little consent form, had the patient sign it. And then would you call that like, long-term marketing you're putting it on youtube then you then you know you guys should check out tony's channels learn medicare billing and the what are, what are some of the other youtube channels you have uh learn medicare billing my total therapy solutions which is my clinic youtube channel that's so getting definitely around. definitely check that out because that's patient facing go ahead it's around yeah, how, and, how large and then it's around twenty eight thousand subscribers and that that's when it'll give you kind of the best idea um, I've got the shoulder guide, which is a shoulder focused channel, which is another patient facing channel. It's around 2,800 or 3,000 subscribers. Um, those are all monetized channels. So they're earning income on a monthly basis. But yeah, you, you get a, a HIPAA compliant consent form, a media consent for the individual. The individual has to retain the right to take, remove or revoke your ability to share that content. But we're already putting students in clinics. Like this is nothing new. We're just taking that student experience and expanding it outside of that. And if you don't want to do that because of liability and HIPAA and risk, you do it with non-patients. You know, Your the idea- Family that members. There, there, yeah, there's always a way to make something like this work. We are just so like by the book that it's easier for us to say, no, I'm not going to do that than for us to explore- it's easier to say, you know, what, what's the saying? Like, don't say, can I do this? Say, how can I do this? And you will find the answer to it. Excellent. Uh, Got to wrap up. Thank you so much for your time. Tony, that was awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. All right. Subscribe, rate, review the show if you find it insightful, helpful. Uh, otherwise, we'll catch you on the next show. Thank you. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. Shoot me an email at dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D-A-V-E at C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, painrelief.com or you can call me at any time, 646-781-8884.